Hi, everybody. I'm very happy and super excited to uh, present this talk today to you, uh, together with my buddy Roland. Uh, the talk is titled With Great Power Comes Great Pwnage. We decided to choose this title, uh, obviously, to attract uh, as much audience as possible. On the other side is also to reflect that um, the, the topic we're talking about, so it's SAML. Okay, everybody's still here, good. SAML uh, is a great security framework that gives you a lot of power, but on the other hand, it's also a very um, dangerous thing if you have security problems with it. You can pwn it pretty much. So, um, let us introduce my, uh, ourselves. So Roland and I both work for Compass Security. We're a local pen tester company. Well, actually, we're uh, in uh, Rapperswil Jona, that's at the other end of the Lake of Zurich. And uh, actually, the the main topic of this talk is we want to uh, present the work that um, Roland and, and another colleague of ours, who's unfortunately is not here today. Uh, did um, as a bachelor's thesis, uh, also with uh, support from Compass. So, uh, the agenda. I'm going to cover the first part of the talk, and we'll do like the theory. I I'd like to lay the foundations, uh, talk about how SAML is uh, built up, and I also want to motivate it with uh, two use cases of uh, Swiss institutions who rely heavily on SAML for their business. And then we'll dive into the protocol details, so if you've gone through the first 20, 25 minutes, then comes the interesting part with uh, Roland uh, showing you um, previous attacks done on SAML and then uh, a demo of this tool and how we found new implementation attack, uh, well, possible implementation for flaws or how you could attack them pretty uh, automatically. So, SAML, that's a new... Um, acronym for you to learn. It stands for Security Assertion Market Language. It's a standard defined by an organization called OASIS. It was specified in 2001. It comes in uh, two versions, 1.1 and 2.0. We're going to talk about the latter one. Um, and as you can think, uh, when you see markup language, yes, it's based on XML and on the XML standard and also on the XML signature standard. It, it relies heavily on this. So, what is it used for? It's actually uh, a framework for cross-domain web signal sign-on. So, you want to allow people to um, sign on once and access different services, but you want to do it uh, throughout your organization boundaries, and obviously also throughout uh, different uh, DNS domains. So here are the basic components of uh, a, s a typical SAML implementation. So you have the client, that's the person who wants to access services. On the other hand, you have your services that provide applications, resources, and so on. And what you typically have in a SAML setup is that all those services share a common user base. So instead of having all those web apps do their own login, you're going to say, no, we're going to rely on a, on a third party. That's the identity provider. And uh, you're typically going to do the, the login on the identity provider. The identity provider is going to uh, provide a proof of the identity of the user and, uh, and uh, transfer it to the service providers who will consume this, this assertion. So from now on, I'm going to use the, the abbreviations IDP for identity provider and SP for service providers. So uh, let's talk about those uh, use cases. So the first one is an association called IGB2B. Uh, it's a, a Zurich-based organization, and their goal is to promote the electronic exchange of data uh, between businesses. And in this case, you have on the left side, you have uh, insurance brokers, and on the right side, you have uh, big insurance companies. Those uh, brokers, obviously, though, so they have a large user base, and for their business, they'd like to 
contact the insurances and, and access their, their web portals, so specifically broker portals, and uh, so they can manage their offers for clients and so on. So obviously, if you're a broker, you would like to have as many uh, connections to as many uh, insurance companies as possible. So what you will typically have is one broker user will have up to 20, like in this case, it, there are 20 insurers, major insurance companies in, in Switzerland who uh, are part of this project. Uh, they they will, will have up to 20 different logins per user to access those. So this association um, recognize this as a problem, also as a security problem, because broker users would typically then start to share their tokens or their credentials, so that's not so optimal. What they did is install an IDP. It's, um, it's uh, well, operated by IGBTB, and they need the trust of both parties. They need the trust from the broker side and from the insurance side, and then you could typically, uh, I'm going to switch back to the slide, here you have so those roughly 4,000 users need uh, per user 20 access or, or credentials. So you end up with 20 times 4,000 equals 80,000. In this case, you're, you'll be able to, to scale it down to 4,000 accounts uh, because you're, you, uh, everybody logs in with one account and then he gets uh, access uh, to uh, all of the needed insurance portals. So it's a way to, to scale down, and uh, so, so the IGBTB also manages all the, the identities. It does the identity and access management, and it's a very successful story. So you see uh, over the last three years, the user base has been constantly uh, increasing, and uh, I think uh, they're, they're a, a really um, a large player in the Swiss market using this technology. So, uh, second use case, uh, now it's in the... Um, uh, it's, it's Switch. Uh, Switch is uh, an, uh, a foundation that... Actually, Switch brought the internet to Switzerland. Uh, it was uh, operated the first backbone, if I'm not mistaken, and they are now typically in charge of institutions like university, hospitals, libraries, and so on. So uh, they're, they're very present in, edu in education. And now in this setup, you have IDPs, you have more than one IDP. You have uh, obviously a, a, a very large user base. It's a time, uh, about 10 times what we saw just before. Uh, so you have students, you have uh, faculty, staff, hospitals, and so on. And every organization typically has his own IDP. And now, when somebody wants to log in, so say a student wants to access e-journals from the library, the library will first need to know, okay, which is your home organization? So there's one part of the protocol that's called uh, where are you from, uh, that uh, discovers the user's IDP and then goes and requests, does an authentication request towards the university. And once you're logged in, you can also uh, go and access your webmail or some research DB that's not hosted, uh, that's not part of Switch. Yeah, that's the way to go. So uh, here, uh, also some numbers. Uh, all those dots here in this, on the Swiss map are the, all the, the institutions that are part of Switch, and we see that the number since 2004 have been also increasing. Now we have about 70 IFDPs. On the other side, we also have uh, the number of accounts is uh, more than 400,000, and the number of SPs on the right side uh, is uh, roughly 1,000 SPs. And on average, we have about 52 SAML authentication requests per minute. So a lot of people rely on this technology. So let's go on to the foundations of, of SAML. SAML as a framework is like an onion. You have a, a lot of layers. The, the innermost layer is the security assertion. It's a piece of XML that states, that makes statements about something. Like uh, an IDP would typically say, this user just logged in 
um, and at, at that time, and I can prove it to you because I'm, I'm signing it right now. So if you, if you trust me, if you verify my signature, you could base, uh, you, you could make some assumptions based on this. So then this, this assertion needs to, to get transported from the IDP to the, um, to the SP. And so you have a protocol that wraps around the, the security assertion. It's also an XML. So at the end, if you have a, an authentication request, it will be a, an XML document. And in a subtree of this XML document, you will have the SAML assertion. So the protocol is rather simple. You have like authentication request, and then on the other side, you have authentication response with the content, uh, with the assertion. There are not too, much, too many protocol messages in this protocol. But still, it's, it's only XML. We need to have a transport layer, and this is the binding. The binding is uh, a way to carry this, this XML document uh, via, for instance, via HTTP. And, and in HTTP, you have different methods. You can do it as a GET request, as a POST request. And uh, depending on, on how much data you want to transmit or which kind of security you have, you, you'll choose the one or the other. Well, we'll get to this later. And then the outermost layer is the profile uh, that just says, OK, what's the, what are we using right now? Which kind of binding are we using with, uh, for, for which uh, protocol variant and which kind of assertions we uh, have. So in this talk, we're only going to talk about the web, web browser single sign-on profile. OK, so let's have a look at it. OK, that, that's uh, a picture taken from the specification from Oasis. On the bottom, you have the browser. On the top left, you have the service provider. And on the right-hand side, you have the identity provider. So the first step, the client accesses the service provider. The service provider doesn't know the user yet. So he says, I'm not able to authenticate you. I'm going to redirect you via um, uh, HTTP redirect with an authentication request to the identity provider. Now, in steps four and five, uh, no, three and four, you'll typically have the normal login form, a form-based, well, HTML-based form uh, on which you can log in. Uh, the, um, Specification doesn't tell you if you want to, uh, how strong you're going to authenticate people. So uh, you can have just a one factor with a password or a sec well, more secure authentication uh, with a second factor. But that's up to the IDP. And then, uh, if login is successful, the IDP is going to generate a security assertion. It's going to wrap it in a SAML response message, and it's going to relay it over the browser, in this one case, to the SP. This means, I, 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 I did a red bubble this time, because at this point, the security assertion is exposed. It could be encrypted. Typically, it is not encrypted, but it has to be signed. Because otherwise, you could write anything. You could be anyone you, you'd like to be. So um, there's another variant. Uh, that's a bit, well, that's more secure because you're not exposing the, the, the assertion. So the first five steps are basically the same. You log in, login is successful. Now the IDP generates the SAML assertion, but we'll keep it. And instead of this, we'll generate a nonce or an, a, we call it an artifact. It's just a reference to the SAML assertion that the IDP is keeping on his side. Now, you're only, only going to transfer the, the artifact and uh, you're going to, uh, the, the SP will then use it to resolve it via a, a, a new interface. It's a SOAP interface, which is called the Artifact Resolution Service. So it's going to take this artifact and uh, get back and, uh, the, the, uh, the SAML assertion. So uh, the benefit here is you don't expose the, this assertion. So you might think, well, it's equivalent. Right, because uh, I mean, the, in the other case, in this case, the assertion is signed. You can't, you, you can't tamper it because it's signed, right? But we'll see that maybe it's possible. So, um, the contents of a SAML assertion, roughly summed up, are you first have a, a little header uh, with a version, 
a unique assertion ID and the issue instant, a timestamp that says when has this assertion been issued. Then you have the issuer, which IDP issued this um, assertion, and then you have a subject. Who are we talking about? That's the, the user typically, and he has a, a name ID. The, the name ID could be anything from a number to an email address. That's uh, a decision to be taken by the, uh, the uh, implementation. And then you also have conditions. Uh, these are kind of like guarantees that the IDP sets. He says, this assertion is only valid if you're not using it before this date and not after another date. And also, uh, who is uh, uh, intended to receive this assertion? So if you, uh, it's up to the SP uh, to check all these values. Um, because the SP is actually going to base assumptions on these, on these values. Then you have the authentication statement that contains, the, again, the authentication instant. That could be a different uh, time than the issue instant, because the authentication could have been this morning, but then the user comes back on the IDP, he has still a valid session, and then the IDP issues a new assertion, but the issue instant now is like this afternoon, although the authentication instant was this morning. So it could be different. And then you have a set of uh, freely definable attributes that you could use to put in anything you want. That can be a source of attack. And then the most important part, obviously, is a digital signature. So the digital signature, you're going to have uh, optionally, you, you can have the X509 certificate, uh, to say who signed it, then you have a signature algorithm transforms that we'll, take, uh, we'll talk about just in a minute in the next slide. Then you have the digest, so the, the hash of the whole XML, and the signature value. So why would we put the X509 certificate within, uh, why would we embed it? In a setup like the one we saw at Switch, uh, you have lots of IDPs, and I mean, every IDP could also have uh, multiple signing certificates because maybe they're migrating a certificate, or maybe they have, I don't know, just different certificates. So the certificate you have here is just to be used as a reference to say, this is a certificate that was used, but please don't use it to sign, uh, to verify the signature. Use your own. Um, okay, so let's get to the signature part. So you have the, the assertion in XML. And as you know, XML is not equal to XML. It could have a, a, a dynamic form. I mean, if I, uh, want, if I wanted, I could write an XML all on one line. Typically, I would like to format it so it's easily readable. But if we are going to calculate a, a computer hash on it, we have to bring it into a form that's... Um, that you could compare on byte level. That means we're, uh, we're going to transform that XML in a canonical form. That's also why we have this uh, C14N that stands for canonicalization, but since it's such a long word, I'm compressed. And then you're going to compute the SHA-1 hash on it to get a digest. So the digest is like a short form that should map to the XML. At the end, you're going to compute an RSA signature on this digest, and, uh, and then you can include the signature in the XML document. On the other side, the, the SP takes the, his trusted certificate and validates the signature with RSA, and he could say go or no go. Okay, so that's all for my part. Now I'm going to pass over to Roland. Thanks a lot. Um, now let's come to the interesting part. Samuel attacks. <laughs> I'm glad you are all here. <laughs> Still here. <laughs> um, what I will give you is a list of possible Samuel attacks. And after that, we will give you show a cool demo with a tool we have developed. And finally, some mitigations, remediations, what you can do against these Samuel attacks. Now, SAML, as we heard, is basically built of SAML itself with the protocols, the bindings, and also XML and, especially, XML signatures. And finally, some certificate stuff, 
Um, the question that pops in mind is, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> now, <clears throat> this year in April, there was a vulnerability at Office 365 um, where there was a problem with SAML. And the problem was more a logical thing. So the setup was like this, that Office 365 is a service provider. So it provides the service like emails, whatever you want. And you with your company, say, let's say company A can have an IDP with all your users and so on, and the company B can have its own IDP with all the users. And the problem was you could create on the IDP of company A a user of, with the email address of company B. And so you could log in with every company account of another company um, that is using Office 365. So with great power also comes great pwnage. Now let's come to some SAML attacks which um, are targeted against SAML. At first, um, you could, if you have guessable IDs, you could log out other users, which does, the uh, does affect the availability a little bit negative. <laughs> um, then, if you um, find uh, such a SAML assertion, like with Google hacking or on Stack Overflow, it is possible there are some SAML assertion, and it is valid and it's posted on its um, and it's posted as a whole SAML assertion. You could try to replay it, and perhaps if the SAML service provider doesn't provide any. Um, mitigations, remediations against message replay, you can log, log in with the SAML message. Let's come to the XML stuff, the XML signatures, and the simplest thing you could um, imagine with a signature is you simply delete the signature. You remove the signature and you hand in the assertion without the signature. Now you would say, yeah, that's, that's a very cheap trick. <laughs> it wouldn't function, but I spoke to a colleague of mine, and it was interesting. He was testing a SAML environment, and the environment was working well, all signatures correctly checked, the certificates correctly checked, and then he finally thought, why not deleting the signature? And surprisingly, he was locked in. So he, he could create um, assertions without a signature and log in as an arbitrary user, as administrator, whatever. So it's not just my imagination. <laughs> um, the next one is XML signature wrapping. You possibly heard of it. There is a cool paper called Unbreaking SAML, be whoever you want to be, which describes this attack um, very good, and they also did an evaluation of some SAML implementations. And it works like you have in real life a contract, let's say, of a Ferrari vendor, and it's signed by the Ferrari vendor. It will sell you a Ferrari. And then you will go and add a second page to that contract. In real life, it wouldn't work, but if you would add this second page to the contract, um, the Ferrari vendor will see uh, the signature on the first page is valid and skip the first page and go to the next page and see, ah, uh, it's to Mr. Bischofberger and it's only f it's sold for $2. And so you come to your Ferrari with XML signature wrapping. Now, how does it work on XML basis? In detail, um, you have a valid assertion here in green and the according signature in blue, which is, re which is referencing the valid assertion. Now, what an attacker would do with XML signature wrapping is he would simply add a second assertion in this XML tree. And it, this would like um, 
this would look like this. And what happens on the service provider is the service provider would validate at first the signature, perhaps, and we would see, yes, the signature is valid. There's a valid assertion. We didn't mangle with the assertion in any way and hand it over to the XML parser. And the XML parser is, in this case, perhaps configured to strip out or take, uh, read out the first um, assertion. And you see, it would read out the subject and the assertion that the attacker has inserted in the XML tree. That happened a lot in a lot of implementations. Now, let's come to the certificate stuff. And um, as a precondition, there is given that the certificate is embedded as a whole certificate in the SAML assertion. Now, at first, what you can do is something we say is clone a certificate. That means we copy all properties of a certificate to a new certificate, generate a new public and private key pair, and finally self-sign the certificate. What you get is a certificate that looks like the other one, but isn't the same. On the first look, it's the same. Then, what you also can try is take a, official, a certificate of an official CA, like VeriSign or, um, let's say, Turk Trust, and <laughs> sign um, the assertion with this official certificate. So you can see if the service provider is validating the certificate against perhaps the trust store of the operating system. And at last, you could use a revoked certificate if you have access to it. Sometimes it's easy to access them or they are already leaked. That's because they revoked. Um, now, let's come to the demo. At first, I will <coughs> um, give you some facts around the demo. It is based on an exploit we found in June 2015. Uh, the problem was that the service provider, when you were using SAML post binding, also the, that means the, the content was flowing through the client, you could mangle it, then um, an embedded certificate um, you were using was not matched with all properties or all fields against the locally stored certificate on the service provider. So what we did is simply clone a certificate and so trick the service provider into believing that the certificate is the real one. And finally, um, the service provider also validated the signature with the embedded certificate we provided. <coughs> so how does it work in detail? At first, you have to intercept the message, stop it, and decode it. That was done with the burp suite. Then we extracted the certificate out of the SAML message and stored it so we can alter it. Then we had to copy it, create a, such a, a cloned, a fake certificate of it. And finally, alter the assertion, change the username to administrator, then sign the whole uh, assertion again, and then encode the assertion and forward it. Now you see the problem is it's a complicated workflow and um, it's time consuming and its errors are really likely to occur. And all, also the problem is if you pen test SAML environments, SAML assertions as Antoine said are only valid for a specific time frame. So <coughs> you have um, to do this mangling, this altering of the assertion in a time frame. And time, with time pressure, Come, um, come errors. 
Now, the solution is, what we did is, we created an extension for Burp. Burp Suite um, is an interception proxy, and as a fun fact, Burp is not beef. And <laughs> it's available on GitHub. It's freely available. You can um, submit your code patches, your features, feel free. So what's possible with SAML Raider is you can sign assertions, you can remove signatures, you can extract a certificate with one click. Also, you have the ability to um, apply some XML signature wrapping attacks on the SAML assertion. And there's also a SAML Raider certificate management interface where you can um, simply clone a certificate and also manage the certificates to sign assertions. Now let's come to the demo, the cool demo. Antoine will be the evil hacker. Um, <coughs> now, imagine we have created a platform. <laughs> imagine you're a bee and you're traveling all day long, you're working all day long and you never got time to get to know another bee. And that's our solution. It's called Airbnb. <laughs> and you can meet other bees and find other bees while working and traveling. Interestingly, you have a SAML login up there, which takes you to the Swiss Federal Department for login. There, Antoine will log in as a normal user. And with the redirection, uh, he's intercepting the traffic. <laughs> so with the redirection, you get back to the Airbnb. And you see you are locked in as a nameless B. Now what you want, what we want is we want to get administrator. Now let's have a closer look at the SAML assertion. For that we will log in again. and intercept the SAML assertion. You see it's encoded in base 64, not really human readable for the most of us, <laughs> I think. And <clears throat> now you can click on SAML Raider and <laughs> <laughs> right. what, it, what it does is um, decode the SAML message and make it human readable. Now, the second part of um, the exploit is extracting the certificate. Ah, certificate. No. Ah. Sorry. Again. Sorry. So, <laughs> I, I just want to show that uh, I, I can try to uh, modify the, um, the assertion like, so I want to log in as an admin, so every occurrence of user I'm going to change it with admin and try to... Okay, now. <laughs> Okay, I don't know how to get back from this mode here. Okay, and try to forward the, the assertion as is. And now uh, the backend tells me, okay, you, you can't do this because you changed the assertion and now the signature is not valid anymore. Okay. So I'm going to log in again on Airbnb. Okay, so since I, I still have a valid um, IDP session right now, I don't have to log in again. So for the federal login side, I still have a valid uh, uh, session and he just issues a new assertion which I intercepted here. Okay, <laughs> let's go on. Um, <clears throat> we now want to extract the certificate, as I said, and that can be done simply by clicking on send to SAML radar certs. And Antoine is now changing to the SAML Radar Certificate Management um, tab, where you see the certificate is already there. And <coughs> now what you want, what we want is to clone it. He has done it already, and what we get is um, all properties are copied to a new certificate, a set, a new private public key pair, and a self-signed certificate, finally. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> it's I not finished yet. Hey. Yes, now. <laughs> out of this mode. So um, let me show you the the properties again. So uh, just clone all those uh, those properties: the serial number, the signature algorithm, the issuer, the subject, and so on. And we just what we do is. Uh, we now have a cloned version of it, and uh, the only thing that's changed is the, the public key, obviously, because we need to have the public key that belongs to our newly generated key pair. Okay. Okay. Now what, you can, what we want to do is change the username in the assertion like we did before. And now sign the assertion with the certificate we can choose on the left side. It's successfully signed. There is a mes message, a small message. Oh, and, just like a <coughs> here. Yeah. and now we can forward it and are hopefully locked in as administrator. And yes, we are the Queen Bee. Now, this is how it worked. Now, what are the mitigations, the remediations against these attacks? Um, at first, if you're configuring a SAML, um, SAML environment, you, have, you could use the artifact binding because then no client is passing and no content is passing through the client. And that means no mangling with the content of the assertion with no mangling with the certificates and so on. After that, if that is not possible, perhaps because the service provider and the identity provider couldn't connect or are not allowed to connect or communicate with each other, then um, post binding is necessary. And if you use encrypted messages, it's a lot harder for the bad guys, for the evil guys to mangle with your assertion because there is an encryption. Now, if you're implementing a SAML service, you could um, only process the signed XML tree. That means delete other content or ignore it. Delete is the more secure way, I think. <laughs> So no XML signature wrapping is anymore possible. Then please make sure that you not um, verify the signature with the included, with the embedded certificate and the embedded public key, because this could be user provided and don't trust user input. So. That's it. Um, I want to give credits to Emmanuel Dus, who has written the bachelor thesis and summer radar with me. He is now at holidays somewhere in the Netherlands or Belgium. Don't know. Um, these are some links if you want to have a closer look at summer radar or the bachelor thesis. So far, are there any questions? Oh, there's one over there. Is there a microphone? Yeah, hello. So, you, you, you hear me? Yeah, fine. Okay. Yep. So, you discuss about SAML single sign on. Uh, today, there is another really popular protocol, which is O2. Are you aware of some? Attacks on this other protocol. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, I, I think basically what what we shown here, you you can also apply to uh, OAuth two. Well, I, I'd say maybe more uh, OpenID Connect, which is based on OAuth two. Uh, the thing is, when you when you exchange a, a, a ticket, an ID token in OpenID Connect. You have basically, or on a conceptual level, the same things. You have an assertion, and you have a, a reference to a key and a signature. And so if you're able to trick the consumer uh, into saying, well, well, you could remove the signature, you could uh, 
trick the consumer into validating the token with another key you provide yourself or go and reference an, another key. So basically, a very similar attacks are, are possible uh, in those uh, settings with, with OpenID, Connect, and OAuth. Yes. Any further mm. questions? Okay. Yes, please. So, so the, this uh, vulnerability is actually related to the configuration and not uh, with SAML, it, how SAML works uh, by default or... Yes, you're right. It's, uh, it's, it's more than a configuration problem, it's an implementation problem. So we, uh, we saw that a couple of times uh, after the, the advisory as well, and typically those were uh, people that implemented SAML themselves. So they, they implement, they, they process the, the SAML thing um, themselves. So it's like in crypto, maybe you would advise to, to tell, use a library, don't do it yourself because there are some pitfalls. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> so you mentioned XML parser. I'm just wondering if you've done some fuzzing as well there. No, not really. <laughs> there wasn't any uh, time to maybe idea fuzzing. for the next thesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, from uh, apart from the the typical XML uh, entity, external entity problems you always have. So that's uh, uh, one more pitfall you would have if you'd implement some on yourself. But uh, uh, your work didn't include uh, fuzzing, huh? No. No more question. Thanks a lot. So thanks Thank to you. him.